got the recording set up. Let me now get the screen share and we will be ready to go. All right. Okay. Sorry that took a second longer than usual. Um, and as you can see, I'm proposing that we continue to discuss what we discussed in person last week and the week before. And as you're aware, I think my uh, basic idea for these lectures is, is to try to mount a conversation amongst ourselves that emulates the kind of conversation that would be occurring in a well-functioning democracy as we approached an election if elections were not the kind of blood sport they seem to be these days, but instead an opportunity for the people of the United States to begin to address the questions that they think are most urgent and can be appropriately addressed in public policy. And the first issue that I'm suggesting we try to drill down on in this way is the question of growing inequality and whether or not the kind of inequality that characterizes a 21st century economy is different in kind than the kind of inequality we've had to cope with in the past and, and the economic argument that it is a new kind and, and that this uh, can be referred to as the curse of wealth. Perhaps Thomas Piketty's uh, research on this is the best known, uh, the, the French economist who's revolutionized the study of inequality, both historically and mathematically and methodologically, but also I'm, I'm drawing in particular the phrase, the curse of wealth from Branko Milanovic and another extremely well regarded economist of inequality who has suggested that when societies become more wealthy, they necessarily become more unequal unless corrective measures are taken. And that the kinds of corrective measures that need to be taken in the 21st century where we are much more wealthy than we were in the 20th century, if we want to have what uh, Breko Milanovic calls egalitarian capitalism, a, a kind of market economy that delivers the goods that a market economy delivers, the, the, the efficiency, the responsiveness, the diversity of goods, the freedom, the decentralization of economic power when a market works the way it's supposed to work, which of course is not always or naturally the case that involves governmental intervention. But having said all of that, if we if, if we want a more egalitarian kind of market economy, we need to reckon with the curse of wealth, the, the fact that wealthier societies tend naturally to be more unequal societies. And so we need new policy measures that take into account the new dynamics driving the concentration of income and wealth in the 21st century. And, and so to frame that argument, to, to gather the right kind of background to address this issue, I started in the last couple of weeks with a historical overview. And, and I'm not going to go deeply into the history again. I'm just going to refresh very quickly our collective memories on the issue that we are much wealthier as a society than any human society has been in human history with you know some rare exceptions luxembourg in the 21st century norway in the 21st century the united states in the 21st century is as good as it gets in terms of just the overall wealth of the society in terms of <coughs> longevity life expectancy literacy health um, all of these metrics suggest that the material basis of society is unrivaled in its capacity to deliver economic security, security in terms of protection from famine, disease, um, back-breaking work, and yet, the paradox, the trouble in paradise, 
we don't seem to be much happier as a result. Quite the contrary. In many ways, it's it's really hard to, to, to get your uh, fingers on the pulse when it comes to something as elusive and hard to define, let alone quantify, as overall or collective well-being or happiness. But I think there's some pretty good evidence that the level of material security that the 21st century economy delivers, that, that the long transition into a post-industrial economy that we talked about the details of the history last week, right? That, that that has not delivered a commensurate improvement in well-being or happiness. The, the uh, 4% of Americans, when given a range of choices to describe their current state of well-being, choose the worst category, despair, that, that large plurality of Americans describe themselves as lonely, as anxious, as insecure, as worried that they are going to not be able to enjoy material security for the rest of their lives, worried in particular that their children's prospects are worse than their own, that their own prospects are declining, and that this seems to be interfering with our well-being. And, and so we have become so wealthy, but we seem not to have figured out how to translate our wealth into collective well-being. And that seems to me to be a, a fundamental failure in our 21st century economy and an essential topic for 21st century politics to be addressing. And yet, I, I, I don't hear it being addressed with the kind of clarity, focus, and creativity that I think this issue demands. Yes, Donald Trump is very good at articulating and amplifying the anger and anxiety that this economy generates. Yes, Joe Biden is trying to strengthen unions, trying to strengthen the middle class, trying to rebuild the American infrastructure. And, and in many ways, I, I think both of them have a, a limited repertoire that reflects on the one hand, the inheritance of their parties and their party's policy positions, but those positions are primarily really 20th century positions, not 21st century positions. We know what the New Deal did. Should we simply replicate it? We know what Ronald Reagan did, cut taxes, limit government, and then wait for economic growth to lift everyone. Is that a 21st century solution? And as I've said to you, I, I think part of the problem here is not only the level of partisan animosity and the kind of negative partisanship we have in which the way to win elections in the 21st century is not by offering positive policy proposals and running on that basis, but instead by mobilizing fear of the other side. So, so, so that is, is one dimension of this. But I think a second dimension is, frankly, that we are pretty much incapable of legislating in Congress in the 21st century. We were having an incredibly difficult time right now on issues that I think most of our elected officials agree are urgent issues providing arms for the Ukraine and Israel and co right, securing the border, right? And, and, and I don't want to suggest that I completely agree on those priorities, but, but it seems clear that the majority of Democrats and Republicans in Congress agree that those are all good things to do. And yet, I think the prospects of getting legislation appear pretty dim at the moment. 
we if we can't do that, how are we going to re-regulate the economy in a 21st century way? And and so it's perhaps understandable that what Biden or Trump propose are inadequate to the dimensions of the problem we face, not innovative, not tailored to a 21st century economy, but we need to, to, to have this conversation and hopefully start spreading the idea that there is work to be done here, there are good policy issues and that we need to ever overcome our partisan paralysis to, to get to a place where we can start legislating. So um, we, we, we spoke uh, last week also about some of what the fact that this tremendous wealth that the last 150 years of economic progress has generated for average Americans is not translating into widespread happiness uh, reveals important truths about economic motivations that we are not simply interested in having more money or the resources that more money can afford. That what we look to more than just how much money do I have, how much income or wealth can I control, what can I buy with that income and wealth, is, is how does though the, the, that right income, wealth, resources, package of consumer goods compare to the historical expectations that I have. If I'm richer today than I was 20 years ago, but I also feel more economically insecure because uh, the wealth that I have has not kept up with the expenses. If I lost my home in 2008 and now I'm a renter and I recognize that 40% of renters are evicted and that I'm struggling, I'll probably never be able to buy a home again. Does it really matter that my income has increased over that period? And even more tellingly, I think, if I'm really worried that my children are not going to have as good an economic prospect as I have. As precarious as I am, they're going to be more precarious. Does the increased wealth translate into increased happiness? No, because we, we, we want to do things with our wealth that are not just consuming, are not just counting the money in our paycheck or our savings account. And so we have to ask about the capacity of the wealth we earn to meet our expectations in the 21st century. Similarly, as we spoke about last week, uh, you can buy a Honda, you can buy a Mercedes. The Honda is a more reliable vehicle. Its cost of maintenance is less. It's more likely to retain its value over time and to last longer. And yet large numbers of Americans, if they have the choice, will choose the Mercedes over the Honda. And, and I don't want to suggest that simply because they're, they're crass and engaged in conspicuous consumption. Yes, there's some of that. But frankly, one of the things we do when we make decisions in a market economy is we try to express the way we understand our social identity. And for many of us, this is about securing a certain kind of status position. And the Mercedes for a certain group of people increases their status in a way that a Honda does not. And therefore they're willing to pay more for it and have a less reliable, more expensive vehicle in order to get that social benefit. And, and I will just suggest the corresponding idea, which we're gonna go into more detail on, the more unequal a society is, the more status conscious and status insecure people become. Status matters more in a more unequal society. We are more sensitive to status in an unequal society. 
as we have become more unequal, the sensitivity to status has increased. The motivation, therefore, to secure status through consumption decisions has increased. And I don't want to suggest, I, I want to be careful here, obviously values differ. And, and raising a child, I tried to convey the idea that you shouldn't be that sensitive to status differences. You shouldn't try to prop yourself up through your consumption decisions. I imagine many of us have, have, have tried to suggest deeper values, but we're fighting an uphill battle in a highly unequal society. Human social psychology isn't fixed, isn't determinative, but it is powerful. And there's a powerful imperative to be status conscious in a more unequal society. It's in the air, it's in between us, it can be hard to resist. And, and so this then suggests, right, that, that we change the metric and, and we recognize that greater affluence by itself does not translate into greater happiness. We need to pay attention to how it's distributed and what we do with our resources and how that contributes to or detracts from well being. And that a 21st century economy, which is an economy of plenty, of affluence, of unprecedented wealth needs perhaps to be measured in a different way, not just via overall economic growth, by which standard we're doing very well, but instead by what that wealth purchases in terms of the well-being of everyone in the population. And by that measure, we seem to be falling short. And then I added one more aspect of this, which is that the quality of work also matters. And, and so if we have become more affluent by reducing the uh, dignity associated with the work that many people do, if many people have become appendages to handheld devices in their work and no longer experience themselves as in any way in charge of what they do with their working day, which for many of us is the majority of our waking hours, if we are therefore not affirmed in our humanity and some of our essential human capacities in our work. And, and finally, if we have surrendered greater and greater control to fewer and fewer people, if the economic enterprise that most of us work for is no longer a stakehold enterprise, an enterprise in which the workers are co-equal in governing the workplace, but instead a shareholder, one where it's only the people who are going to make profit that get to decide the direction the company is going to take, then we are less likely to be happy at work even if work pays us a lot, this may undermine our sense of well-being. So with, with that then reviewed and in mind, as always, feel free to ask a question, raise an issue whenever you have it, but, but I do want to move on. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to start right where we, where we left off with this idea that's sometimes called a hedonic treadmill, right? And, and, and so this quote from Richard Easterman, who is a Nobel Prize winning economist from the middle of the 20th century, he points out that, that we seem to be stuck on this treadmill where we think, well, we just need a little bit more wealth and then we will be fine. And, and what is interesting is that this appears to be a perpetually vanishing goal, right? And the closer you get to it, the further away it seems. And, and so Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in his discourse on the nature and origins of inequality, helps us to maybe see some of what's going on, where we seem to get acclimated to 
new levels of wealth, new levels of convenience, new levels of material well-being, or that's not the right way to put it, uh, material supply. And, and then as opposed to enjoying the new level of consumption and provision, because we've acclimated to it, we generate new vulnerabilities. If that stuff is taken away, we're going to be worse off. But if it's provided, we just take it for granted. And, and so in both these ways, there's a suggestion that after a certain point of wealth, increased wealth is not going to contribute to further happiness and further well-being for reasons that we can understand. And yet, we seem to have a hard time transitioning into the mindset of plenty as opposed to the mindset of scarcity. We are evolved creatures, and we evolved in a world in which scarcity was the basic material baseline. And, and so we seem to be um, strongly psychologically inclined to think that we need more. Please note, among other things, we have an epidemic of obesity in our society. And again, this seems to be twofold. Uh, on the one hand, we have a, an obesogenic uh, food supply, right? We, we just don't have very healthy food stuffs in our grocery stores and our restaurants, as opposed to stuff that tends to um, cause us to gain weight in ways that are not particularly healthy for us. But more importantly, I think we are inclined to take as many calories as we're offered, right? And, and, and if we're offered more calories than we need, it's actually hard to restrain ourselves because by nature, we have evolved in a world where that was a rare circumstance and almost always going to be followed by scarcity. So stock up now because tomorrow you may need to draw down that reserve. Not only that, we do have an inclination to engage in what's sometimes called hedonic eating. That is to say to, to compensate for our lack of satisfaction in other regards by consuming calories. And I, I think there's a general point about the consumer economy, which going back to the anti-consumerist literature of the 1960s, the consumer ethics literature of the last 25 years, many people point out this is exactly what advertising preys on, is the sense that whatever you're lacking in your life, you can address through consumption. It turns out we should know by now that that's not true. And, and so if we are interested in the happiness, the well-being, the satisfaction with their lives of individuals in our society, we should maybe relax the idea that, we, that all we need is more and begin thinking about what other kinds of provision of material goods seem better equipped to secure happiness in the 21st century. So I'm going to start now looking at some data and, and some analysis. And, and I'm going to start with two basic ideas. And, and, and this was really the jumping off point for deciding that this issue should be the first issue we discuss in detail. And I believe you've seen at least one of these diagrams before. Or if not, you're familiar with at least the, the basic idea of the data that it presents, which is at the beginning of the 20th century, we were incredibly unequal. We refer to that as the Gilded Age, right? The, this shows you the share of the top 10% relative to overall national income. In the 1920s, the top 10% had 50% of the national income. We get the Great Depression followed by World War II, followed by the New Deal institutions and the GI Bill taking hold. And then we get what's called the Great Compression, right? That, that is to say, there's a coming together of the bottom and the top 
uh, and the top 10% are now taking only about a third as opposed to 50% of the income. And then look at what has happened since the 1980s, right? The, the share of the top 10% has gone up and up and up to the point where it now exceeds what it was in the 1920s, a new gilded age. Um, and, and so this begins to get us into the curse of wealth, the idea that the kind of wealth creation we've had in the United States in the neoliberal period for the last roughly 45 years has been a, a kind of wealth creation that goes hand in hand with growing inequality, growing precariousness. Then looking at, I think, the, the worst the, the most alarming indication of the effects of, of, of growing inequality. This is the, the so-called deaths of despair metric. And, and, and so Anne Case and Angus Deaton uh, coined that phrase and began collecting data along these lines, th this diagram updates their data somewhat, and, and I'll point out for a moment that, that there's controversy surrounding this idea that, that it's purely inequality driving the increase in deaths of despair. Let me just note that controversy and put it to one side for a moment. What I really want to focus on here is not necessarily the correlation between inequality and deaths of despair, just the coincidence, right? And, and, and so we have become more unequal. We've also become a, pop, a, a society in which a larger and larger share of the population dies from suicides, alcohol-related deaths, and drug overdoses. And some of this does have to do with the opioid epidemic, the, the ready availability of the kinds of drugs that are driving the drug overdose numbers. But please just note, right, that, that this has been increasing year after year after year from 2000 to 2023 to the point where it's driving down the overall life expectancy in the United States. And I think you have to look at that data and say, something is wrong. This is not what should be happening in the richest society in human history. So, so, so let me continue for a moment with some of the analysis. Again, just noticing that once you get over $20,000 per year per person, there is no positive correlation between increased wealth and increased health and social well-being right? The, the richest society has uh, the worst score. A very rich society has a better score, but also some relatively poor societies, right? Where the, the income per person is almost half what it is in the richest societies do very well. And, and this then leads us to look at this data in a different way. If instead of trying to correlate wealth, with health and social well-being, we correlate equality with health and social well-being. What we see is a very strong, clear correlation. The more equal a society, the better it does in terms of life expectancy, math and literacy, infant mortality, the rate of murder and imprisonment, teenage birth, trusts, obesity, mental illness, social mobility. The more unequal, the worse that it does, right? And, and then we get to why it is that our society is becoming more unequal. And, and I'm going to focus for a moment, moment on Thomas Piketty, but then I'm really going to get into the other work that I'm drawing on. And, and um, Piketty suggests quite clearly, and, and with vast reams of historical evidence drawn from tax data in France and the United States and Britain going back hundreds of years and with mathematical 
and sociological models that basically the rate of return on capital tends to be higher than the rate of overall economic growth. And, and, and the right idea here essentially is that people who have money to invest will not invest that money if they could just put the money in a savings account, not take the risk, not in, be involved with managing how their money is being invested or the corporations that they're owning in order to generate the growth that they experience if they could just put it in a savings account. And, and generally speaking, savings accounts keep up with the overall economic growth rate. So, so for capitalism to work, for the owners of capital to be incentivized to invest their capital productively, the rate of return on capital tends to be higher than the rate of overall economic growth. And what that means is that over time, capitalists, people who make their income primarily through investing, tend to get richer. The rich get richer. And that tends to mean that over time, the concentration of wealth in the class of people who live primarily through investing grows, right? And, and, and so the fundamental engine of inequality has a relatively straightforward economic explanation. And in order for the rate of return on capital to be higher than the rate of overall economic growth, it tends to be the case that that means that the rate of return on capital has to be higher than wage growth, right? If, if wage growth is too high, capital returns goes down and you end up with what some people call an investment strike, right? The, the people who own capital refuse to invest or go invest somewhere else until they can get a rate of profit that they consider to be adequate. And, and so this is, again, going to generate inequality. If there are two groups of people in your society, those whose income comes primarily through wages, those whose income comes primarily through investment, the people who live off their investments are going to see their wealth increase more quickly than the people who live off of wages. That's going to drive inequality. The wealthier a society becomes, the wealthier the wealthy become relative to everyone else. And, and, and this is exactly what we see in the United States. Now, it's worthwhile noting, and, and, and this is Thomas Piketty's more recent research, that in the middle of the 20th century, we adopted policies to counteract these trends, right? And, and, and those policies were manifold. Some of them were just minimum wage policies. Some of them were pro union policies. Some of them were policies that got workers greater education so that their labor was worth more to those who employed them. Some of them were measures like the GI Bill that gave people who did not have the capital enough money to purchase their own homes and then as a result, their wealth began to go up. And, and so as you can see, both in terms of income, the black uh, lines here refer to the United States, the, the lighter data points refer to Europe. Um, the share of income of the richest 10% went from being, right, this is the Great Compression data that we saw, uh, up in the 50% to, to down around a third, and then right back up again. In Europe, it started out higher, got more equal, and has not become as unequal. With regards to wealth, the lasting and permanent so far contribution that 20th century social policy has made is the creation of a solid middle class, right? You can see that the beginning of the 20th century for both the United States in black and Europe in white uh, or, or light colors, uh, the um, 
difference between the wealth of the uh, middle 40% and the poorest 50% was margin, right? But in the middle of the 20th century, the middle class actually began to approach the level of wealth of the top 10%, right? Compression. Please note that especially in the United States, but in Europe as well, the poorest 50% really did not benefit from these wealth creation policies. But the middle 40% did. And they, by the way, have continued to maintain that advantage, not to the same degree vis-a-vis -vis the wealthy, but pretty much vis-a-vis -vis the poor. And, and part of what this reflects is if the primary vehicle for entering the middle class is home ownership, which, which is a mechanism of force savings and wealth accumulation, then owning a home actually tends to be a intergenerational asset for perpetuating middle class status. If you own a home, you can draw on some of the value accumulated in your home by, for instance, taking out a second mortgage in order to assist your children in acquiring homes. And by the way, upwards of 90% of the people buying a home for the first time in the United States get assistance from their parents doing so. The problem with the people at the bottom is that they never got a home. And so it turns out that uh, once you've created a middle class, the middle class can be stabilized, hopefully, but it's very hard to enter the middle class in terms of wealth. And so again, right, with regards to wealth, it's a little bit more complicated, but the basic pattern holds that we see in income as well, great inequality, greater equality. We relaxed, changed our policies, but also our economy changed. And as a result, the return of inequality. I'm, I'm going to now turn to uh, Banko Milanovic's work, the, the, the book that he published a few years ago called Capitalism Alone. And I think it's very helpful what he does in, in this work. And in particular, one moment, sorry. Um, he's got to be able to keep track of the time as well. He um, talks about three kinds of capitalism. Classic capitalism, which he identifies with Britain before 1914, social democratic capitalism, which he identifies with the US in the aftermath of the New Deal, and liberal meritocratic capitalism, which is 21st century capitalism, the kind that the United States has right now. And one of the things that, that he points out is, is that the social democratic variant of capitalism is quite a bit more egalitarian than the liberal meritocratic version. The version that we have now is less equal than the version that we had in the middle of the 20th century. And this diagram, I think, helps us to understand some of the things that differentiate our economy from the economy of the middle of the 20th century, right? So, so is there a rising share of capital income overall? And in the middle of the 20th century, the answer to that question was no. Today, it's yes. The people who own capital are getting more and more of the income. Is there a high concentration of capital ownership? Yes. Is the capital, are the capital abundant individuals, the people who invest for a living, rich? Yes. Are they also rich in terms of income? And here, please note that answer was no before 1914, no in the middle of the 20th century, and yes in the 21st century. And, and so here you can think about the stereotype of an old British aristocrat who owns a lot of money, but who is not going to deign to work, right? Work is beneath them. That's not what a uh, rich, dignified person does. Whereas in the 21st century, 
the children of people who have a lot of wealth tend to go to work. And not only that, because their parents have a lot of wealth, because a lot of has been invested in their education and cultivating them, they tend to get good education. And then they tend to get jobs that pay a lot. And so they're not only rich in terms of the capital they inherit from their parents, they're also rich in terms of the income that they generate in the present generation. And that does two things, right? That exacerbates inequality. They're now getting two income streams, both of which make them richer, the income from their investment, but also the income from their labor. But second of all, it tends to muddy the water in terms of the argument for distributive justice. Why should I have to give away any of my wealth? I work hard for it. I didn't just inherit daddy's wealth. I'm not just living off of investments and not doing anything. I'm working hard as a corporate lawyer or a CEO or a doctor. And so I should enjoy the benefits of my hard work I deserve, I have earned, I merit the greater wealth that I have. So, so th that's an important variable as far as Milanovic is concerned. Um, next, is there what's called homogam? Marrying essentially at your same class level, right? So, so marrying among people who are similar to you. And what you see is, again, in the middle of the 20th century, not so much. There were more what are called madmen marriages, right? People who married their secretaries uh, or, or married somebody from another class. And, and by the way, Thomas Piketty points out in great detail that perhaps the most important avenue for upward economic mobility is marrying someone who is wealthier than you are. And so um, when we stop doing that, as we've done in the 21st century, then we end up with one of the main vehicles producing economic mobility vanishing. Finally, is there a high correlation of income between parents and children? And, and he puts in parentheses, transmission of advantage. And um, the answer uh, is yes. Yes, but in some cases weak and yes, right? And, and, and so in the middle of the 20th century, we were better at taxing inheritance. We were better at providing free, high quality public education and assistance in acquiring homes. And the result is that the correlation between parental wealth and child's wealth weakened in the middle of the 20th century, those policies have been undone and it's back with a vengeance in the 21st century. And, and what uh, Milanovic also does, sorry, uh, trying to just move the, the internal to the slide here, um, is show that whether we're talking about the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, or Norway, a similar trend holds for all of them as they have become wealthier societies. Those who own capital have become richer relative to those who work for a living. This is the fundamental trend, what he calls the curse of wealth, and it occurs for completely natural economic reasons. This is not just plutocracy or oligarchy. This is the underlying tendency of an economy that is producing more wealth. The wealth tends to accrue primarily to the people who already own the wealth, who are investing. As they get more wealth, they can invest more, make yet more wealth. That makes the society as a whole richer, but in particular, it makes the rich richer. And then they can use their wealth to do things like transmit advantages to their children. And so inequality is a self-perpetuating social trend in 21st century economics. That's the fundamental takeaway from this literature. And then we can see it playing out 
in all kinds of trends, right? So, so the rate of growth of income for people who work has been steadily decreasing since the 1950s into the current decade for people in the most developed economies in the world. The rate of inequality in the developed world has been steadily increasing. This is just what's called a Gini coefficient, a, a fancy way of measuring inequality. And in particular, I think this is really important, the labor share, the amount of wealth that the economy generates that is paid out for wages for people who work has gone down steadily in the developed world and is likely to continue to go down for the foreseeable future. The result in the United States, of course, is that we become more equal, much more unequal, right? This diagram shows the top 5%, the top 20%, the bottom 20%, and then the groups in between. As you can see in the 1960s, these groups were tightly grouped together. By the time we get to the end of the last decade, look at the distance between them. Look in particular how the top 20% and the top 5% have left everybody else behind. Look at how stagnant the bottom 20%'s income has been relative even to the people relatively close to them. What we see is that this is not, right, because the economy has stopped growing, Productivity, in fact, has been increasing quite dramatically over this period. But wages, earnings have stayed incredibly stagnant. Household income has gone up slightly, mainly because women are entering the workforce or people are working more jobs. I think, again, it's worthwhile noting when you talk about people under 40 in the United States, they if they are people who work for a living, assume that they're not just going to have one job at a time. There's a whole literature on this. It's often called the side hustle. If you talk to an Uber driver, if you talk to somebody who's perhaps pulling a shot of espresso at Starbucks, what you will hear is that this is not the only job they have. This is something that they do in their spare time because Income does not keep up with expenses if you have only one job. You need to get another job because wages are stagnant to keep your household income increasing. We can see in particular, and, and I think this is important to notice, that when we have right a period of economic growth, where do the benefits of that growth go to? And, and this separates the lowest 20% from each of the groups above it and the top 5%. And what you can see is in the 1960s and 50s, it's the lowest 20% that are gaining the most benefits of economic growth. And that's extremely important for maintaining a relatively equal distribution of income in your society. It's why not only is the distribution relatively equal, it's staying relatively equal until we get to the 1980s. And what we see again is beginning in the 1980s, right? Actually, the bottom 20% are now losing income. The top 5% are doing the best. And, and, and that pattern basically holds from 1980 to the present. If we start looking now at the top 10%, they're doing much better than the bottom 90% beginning, right? You can see bottom 90% in blue, top 10% in red, exactly the inflection point, right? It occurs in the 1980s and continues consistently into the present era. If we start looking at the top 1%. And again, I, I, I find this to just be extraordinary and almost obscene, right? That this is as clear an evidence that you can get that our economy is 
frankly, oligarchic in the distribution of the benefits of wealth creation. The top 1% in the economic recovery after the Great Recession got 95% of the gain in income produced by the economy for those three years. And, and so again, we, we can see this dynamically, the income change in the top 1% from 1980 to the present far exceeds the income gain of everyone else. The top 1%, the top 10% are keeping pace with the overall rate of the economy. Everybody else is doing worse than overall economic growth. This is a clear indication of the kinds of structural economic phenomena that Piketty and Milanovic are describing. So uh, just one more way to look at this, what it looks like to move from a relatively equal to a relatively unequal society. The people at the bottom used to be quite comparable to the people at the top. Now they live in totally different worlds. And, and so that's one central element of the curse of wealth. And, and, and I just want to spend a couple minutes um, talking about some additional elements. In addition to inequality, what does increased wealth do to our economy in the 21st century? And, and I'm going to start with decreasing mobility and equality of opportunity. And, and the data here are quite clear, right? Economic mobility in the United States basically has stalled, right? If you're, if you're born in the bottom 20%, 43% chance that your children will stay in the bottom 20%. Less than 5% chance that they'll get to the top 20%. If you're born in the top 20%, 40% chance that you'll stay there for the rest of your life, less than a 10% chance that you'll tumble down, right? And, and, and so as you can see, very little economic mobility. Most people stay at the level at which they were born. And then I just want to add, right, that to be as clear as possible about the trend here, this is called sometimes the Great Gatsby Curve. And, and what it shows is that the more unequal a society is, the less generational mobility or intergenerational mobility it has, right? And, and, and so the United States and the United Kingdom are the most unequal societies alongside uh, Italy with the least intergenerational mobility. Finland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, they're more equal societies and they have more intergenerational mobility. The reason is twofold. First of all, the rungs on the ladder are farther apart. And so it's harder to climb up. It's harder to get out of the bottom 20% because you've got to climb further. But second of all, because the risk of falling is much greater in a more unequal society, those at the top will invest more in keeping their children at the top, which de facto means keeping anybody else from rising to the top. And, and so this is a very robust finding. More unequal societies have less economic opportunity and mobility. And therefore, if you're born at the bottom, you're stuck there in a more unequal society. Uh, a second aspect of, of rising wealth has been the erosion of poverty reducing policy as a result of globalization. In order to sustain a robust welfare state, among other things, we have to have relatively high rates of taxation. But if we have high rates of taxation in a global economy, the people who own capital can pick up their capital and invest elsewhere, go where the taxes are lower. We see an awful lot of this occurring in the 21st century. And so there's a kind of race to the bottom in which in order to attract capital and investment, we don't 
maintain the taxes necessary to fund robust poverty reducing policy. We also find that older social policy as well as industrial policy are not adequate to countering new kinds of inequality. We're going to get into this on the on the policy front in greater detail next week, but I just want to be as clear as possible. We can't just renew the New Deal. We, we, we don't just need to go back to FDR's playbook and start implementing his policies again. If I were to be critical of Joe Biden and his administration, the main criticism along these lines would be that we need innovative 21st century thinking and that the policy playbook seems to really just be the old democratic playbook. Fourth problem with 21st century wealth is that the level of inequality undermines democracy. It's not just that our economy is oligarchic, our politics seem to be increasingly oligarchic as well. And, and I'll, I'll stop there, we can come back to that theme, but I do wanna to get to the other ideas here. The erosion of what's sometimes called ethical capitalism. The idea, well, that of course you're going to pay your taxes. Of course, you're going to treat your workers well. This is what it means to be a good upstanding capitalist. That there's a um, obligation that comes with the privilege that affluence represents. And, and I, I think we see this a lot in the second half of the 20th century, both in terms of, of charity or philanthropy, and also in terms of the way in which capitalists at least present themselves publicly. But in the 21st century, we have much more an ethics of ruthless capitalism. Greed is good. Everything is permitted. Why should I pay my taxes if I can get away with not paying them? And, and you will note that Donald Trump has said this very publicly. Of course he didn't pay his taxes. Why would he? That would have been a stupid thing to do. And right, that didn't hurt him politically in 2016 when he made those pronouncements, right? It, 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 it's incredible, I think, for those of us whose values were set in an earlier era. And yet I think Trump is the, the, the perfect exemplar of the new ethics of a kind of ruthless competition of conspicuous consumption. You, you, you look into his old reality TV show, The Apprentice, and it's all about sitting on gold thrones and marble toilets, right? It, 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 it's the, a, a kind of display of wealth that again, I think people in an earlier era found to be in bad taste. The commodification of everything, right? And, and, and here I'll point for a second to Airbnb, right? You have a, a, a private home, a, a nice home or an apartment, someplace people want to visit. It used to be you considered that your inner sanctum, your space of intimacy, your retreat from the world. Now you consider it an opportunity to make money and you put it up for rent and you, you go stay with a friend when it's in high demand or, or you get a second home in a less expensive place from the money you're making selling out your first home week by week, day by day, right? And, and, and whether it's um, selling ourselves as influencers on social media, selling our spare time as Uber drivers or access to our vehicle in that way as well. The sense that in the 21st century and this kind of capitalism, increasingly there is no demarcation between that which isn't and that which is commodified, that which we treat as an opportunity to make profit and that which we hold out of the market because it has values that are not well captured and perhaps even destroyed if they are marketized. And, and so is my home my space of retreat, my realm of intimacy and relaxation, 
or is it just being produced in order to be sold? And, and, and so the, the final issue here, atomization, there's very good evidence that the richer a country becomes, the fewer people get married, the shorter relationships last, the fewer friends people have, the less extensive their social networks are. And that does appear to be related to the level of wealth and what that wealth enables us to do in terms of exempting ourselves from social networks and the kinds of dependency and compromise they represent. But please note, right, friendship, love, marriage, parenting, yes, they're difficult. Yes, they involve emotional investment, but they're also some of the most satisfying human activities available. And so if in various ways, increased wealth is not producing increased happiness, what can we be doing in the 21st century to counteract some of the, it appears, inexorable trends of our economy. That seems to me to be a really important issue and one that we seem to be head in the sands about when it comes to public policy debate in the United States as we approach a national election in the 21st century. Let me stop there. And it looks like, uh, yes, Bonnie, is that you? you've got your hand up? Go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. There you go. <laughs> what we could do is bring an end to war all over the world. We could have peace. If everyone agreed to have peace, we would all be working together. There wouldn't be an upper and a lower. There would just be everybody. Yeah, and and thank you for the comment. And and especially as right, we we, we look with such um a, I, I, I'm I'm struggling for words here. It's such despair at what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in the Ukraine, the growing risk of a widening war in the Middle East. Yes, <laughs> I think one of the things, and, and, and I will point out to you very quickly, the literature on economics and war points out there's, there's a very strong correlation between inequality and international warfare. And, and the reason is, is pretty straightforward. Inequality erodes the domestic market for the goods that a economy produces because you no longer have a robust middle class to consume all of that. So, so you go abroad looking for markets, looking for places to sell what you cannot sell domestically and that results in international rivalry. So, so th there is a connection between what we're talking about economically and what we're worried about in terms of international conflict. Having said that, I, I think, Bonnie, your, your comment also takes us to a, a deeper issue, which is that in the middle of the 20th century, there seemed to be a more cooperative ethos overall greater solidarity, a sense that we're all in this together. Some of that came out of the Great Depression and the common experiences of vulnerability. Some of that came out of World War II and the democratizing experience of everyone being thrown into battle together. We seem to have lost that sense of common humanity and become much more competitive, much more individualistic, much more atomized in the 21st century. This plays out in warfare, but it also plays out in a lack of concern for the suffering or vulnerability of fellow human beings, whether that's in war internationally or domestically. So, so yes, that, that seems like there's a value dimension we need to get back to. Thank you, thank you for the good comment. Anybody else today? David, are you, you getting on? Yes, uh, I, I, 
did I just dream this or did I read uh, a few months ago that uh, a group of high profile multi-billionaires uh, came out with a statement that saying that they um, uh, would welcome uh, returning to a higher tax rate for the very, very wealthy. And I don't know how in heaven's name can we promote that ethical stance rather than um, uh, Trump's uh, uh, get away with whatever the hell you can uh, stance. Uh, it seems to me that that we can't address uh, the, the current crises we face without some uplifting of our moral and ethical uh, dispositions toward um, our, our participation in society. And I don't exactly know how to do that. I don't, I don't think it's all political. I think some of it does require, I mean, it has to translate into political and economic action, but it has, it seems to me it has to start with some sort of re, uh, revitalization of, um, uh, of the moral and ethical basis uh, of these issues. And, and I, I think you are right about that group of billionaires. And I think that it's kind of the usual suspects. And, and so Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, George Soros come to mind. And one of the things I would point out is that precisely because those uh, billionaires tend to be more philanthropic, they're doing things with their money other than trying to purchase influence on behalf of their politics, right? Which doesn't mean they're not making large contributions or setting up political action committees. But when we compare them with the Koch brothers network, right? And and I, I think it's you, you you've got to ask, you know, where do most billionaires place their bets politically? There's a lot more money going from the hyper wealthy to political candidates who oppose redistributive taxation than the handful of billionaires saying tax us more, right? And, and it is a, a real problem with the self perpetuating economics or, or dynamics of an unequal economy. Once there's a large concentration of wealth, those who have all the money can spend the money to keep the money, right? They, they invest it in tax havens. They invest it in lobbying to keep the IRS from enforcing tax policy against the tax havens, right? Please note that that got stripped out of the Inflation Reduction Act. They invest it in candidates who are going to keep their taxes low in a tax code that doesn't have high inheritance taxations, we could keep going, right? And, 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 and so I guess I would say, David, we should be careful not to simply focus on the people who are saying, tax me more, right? Recognize that there are a lot of people with a lot of money who are not saying it out loud, but investing that money to prevent politicians right. from taxing, from passing tax reform legislation. But that's why, uh, that's why I think that um, we can't just work on the economic and political fronts. Uh, I, that's why I think this uh, revolution and uh, 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 a, a moral revolution is almost called for. I don't know how we can do it without changing the way we think about our relationship to the common good, uh, you know, it's about it's ultimately about you know uh, the totem bonum, the good for all, and the and the um, what's the other one, the ethical one, the 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 one that is about justice and, and equity. I can't remember what it is, but that's and I don't know how to do that. I, I suppose at one point that's what um, organized religion was supposed to do for our society. I don't think it's capable of it anymore. And so then the question is, is what institutions are. Yeah, and, and so I'm gonna just point in the direction of generational change, right? And, and, and so um, one of the things I think we see, for instance, with feminism, you know, we, we, we tend to think, well, women became more 
uh, willing to stand up for their rights, more assertive, less willing to put up with um, patriarchy and degradation and harassment. But what the data seem to suggest is actually what happened was not a change of women's minds, a value shift. It was a generational shift that, that the women in particular who were born of the uh, baby boom, um, they grew up with mothers who had worked, Rosie the Riveter, the war drive, and, and, and they were encouraged to have different values, right? And so I think one of the questions is going to be, does a new generation rise that has different values that's perhaps less materialistic, more solidaristic? And if so, how do they take hold, get enough power to change the culture, change the tax code, change the institutions? That seems to be the model of the New Deal. I think that's the model that we've got to hope for in the 21st century. Flossy, I can see you raising your hand. Go ahead. You've got to unmute yourself, remember. Are you there, Flossy? I'm not hearing you. You're still muted. Got to hold the space bar down, right? Yes. Yes, there you go. Okay. I have kind of two opinions. Here you are doing something that other people are doing too, but not with the success that you have. A lot of my young friends are leaving the classroom to teach on Zoom. They're having mixed success, but those who are having success are earning lots of money. Teaching on Zoom can be very rewarding financially they have to be very good at it and very well prepared. What worries me is that the classroom no longer offers the security and the hope that it once did. That may or may not be a good thing. What does worry me is that there's no really powerful organization to stop what's going on with the electrocution of the classics, of the distrust of them, and disgust for them. I'm not sure what to do about that because my, we my own weapons are fading. I know that this is a time for change. I should welcome it, but I'm scared. Um, maybe that's a good thing too. That's my well, yeah, I've, I've got a couple comments to what you, what you're saying, um, and and so I'm going to start with the idea of the gig economy, uh, and and so you you may be familiar with this phrase, you may not, but I think it's worth unpacking for a second, right? A gig, right, is something we 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 think about from music, right? You know, you you've got this short term. Uh, contract to play one or two nights at this club. You've got a gig, right? And and the gig economy refers to the fact that for many people in the workforce today, you get a job for a week or a month or a day, and then it goes away, right? And then you got to get another job, and you got to get another job, right? There's there's a kind of built-in churn and instability, and right. I'm deeply worried that we're getting, and I'm, I'm going to speak to higher education. I'm not sure which level of education you were referring to, Flossie, but this is the, the, the place I've got the best experience with, uh, a, a gig academy, right, where most of the faculty at many institutions now are temporary faculty, right? Yeah. And, and the result is that you don't build trust, you don't build relations with your students, you don't have the time to invest because you're always looking for a new job, and, and that it's eroding the ethos of higher education 
that used to be a collaborative enterprise in pursuit of lasting knowledge and the meaning it allows you to create, right? And then I'll go to, to David Brooks, who, who I sometimes like and sometimes don't like, but his column a couple days ago, which was on the humanities and, and how the humanities humanize us and how in the 21st century, there are fewer and fewer students studying literature, studying history, studying philosophy, studying art, studying culture. And he postulates that our society is meaner because the humanities equips us with, uh, the humanities equip us with the, the, the resources to enter each other's situations imaginatively. Yes. Read Dostoevsky, you, you, you can enter somebody else's mindset. And if you can enter somebody else's mindset, then you can sympathize with them, even if you don't agree with them. If mm -hmm. all we study is business and economics and computer science and technology, we're not equipping ourselves with the resources of imaginative identification that the humanities cultivate. And, and please note, yes, there is a war on the humanities in many places at the level of elementary school and secondary education as well as higher education. And, and so, yes, I, I do share your concern. Um, I think that might be a good place to, to leave it for today. It's good as always to be with you. I, I do uh, want to just appreciate your, your uh, compliment, Flossie. Thank you for telling me I'm doing Zoom education reasonably well. I'm not profiting hugely from it, but I do enjoy my Saturday morning sessions with you guys for sure. And that's profit enough, especially given everything we've been talking about today. So you guys be well, take care, and I will look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, guys.